The Sony Burano, one of the most anticipated cameras to release this year, bridging the gap between Sony's prosumer line of the FX series to the Cine Alta cameras that are seen to shoot so many movies today. A camera that I was personally excited for just due to its form factor and Venice level image quality in such a small package. In this video, I'm going to go over my experiences with the camera of shooting a full on beauty product campaign with it. I'm going to talk about what I liked, what I disliked, and just generally my whole experience working with this camera as a commercial cinematographer. Before we dive into this video, we'd like to give a huge shout out to Vistec, which gave us this camera for a whole entire week so we could really put it through its paces. And speaking about that, we just didn't wanna go shoot around and give you a lazy review of the camera, but we actually wanted to put this through a high paced real production to showcase the strengths and weaknesses and what this camera really is about. The first thing I wanna talk about is what I really like about this camera and commend Sony for what they were trying to do with the system. Ultimately, this camera's form factor is small and amazing and has a beautiful image straight off of the camera. It has a better image than the FX6 and FX9 and it stacks up with the Venice 1 and 2, but in the form factor similar to the FX6. Now, I am personally a Venice owner, and my biggest gripe with that camera specifically is its size, especially with the raw recorder. It is great for studio and bigger commercial work, but if you're doing something more doc or narrative style, it gets really tricky to use. This is where the Burano comes in with its small form factor and image that is absolutely beautiful. The biggest question that I want to answer in this video, and I had myself, is this camera made for commercial work? To answer that question, we tried a lot of new things with making a product commercial that felt very commercial. What I mean by that is making it feel very elevated from camera movements, a set build, and a very high key feel with multiple different lighting setups. When we received the camera, it was basically straight out of the box, so we didn't have a lot of mounting points for anything. So we kind of had to Frankenstein all our other cameras together to really make this camera work. Out of the box, I was impressed with the stock top handle that came with the camera, but not so impressed with the display and EVF option. I know I know this was a huge complaint with a lot of other people who tried using the camera, but the length of the viewfinder cable as well as the mount system that is provided is kind of unusable for me and a huge turnoff. For the sake of this project, I used the provided display as a monitor as well as to control the camera. And in an environment where you need a small setup like that, where you don't have to adjust your built-in monitor a lot, I would 100% recommend it. But for commercial work, I would recommend an external monitor and have the provided display mounted as a pure control surface on the operator side or the AC side of the camera. And this is similar to the Venice. Although the ergonomics of the display aren't the best, the usability of the amazing touchscreen features as well as the more tactile feeling buttons are great. I feel like on the FX6 and FX9, the buttons don't feel great to use and the Brano solves all of that. The menu system is very similar to the FX9 and FX6 with a few added features and a whole variety of custom buttons. For this project, we shot on the Cook S4s at Super 35 mode at 5.8K. I don't really know why they made this camera 8K. 4K is usually all we need for any work that we're doing and 6K just provides us a lot more leverage in terms of squeezing a bigger image out of anything. So I was really confused why Sony came out with an 8K camera that is not really needed in this market. For this commercial, we're primarily on a Chapman dolly where we're doing a lot of dollying, jibbing, and rotation movements with our subjects. We rented out this piece of gear with a bunch of accessories so we could achieve the exact shots we were looking for. If you want a dedicated video on how we achieved a lot of these movements, let us know in the comments below. The reason why we use this dolly was to get a lot of controlled movements that kind of represented a robotic camera, but on a budget. We were really pushing the commercial look, and this was one step closer to achieving that. I really wanted to test out the camera in terms of all these features, especially the dual base ISO. We shot the first scene at 3200EI and the rest at 800. What I should have done is rated my camera one stop over by changing the EI one stop down so I could compensate, but even with a properly exposed image, we found noise all over it and even in the highlights. This is a similar issue I saw with the FX6 and not necessarily the FX9 or FX3. I never really trusted the second base ISO of the FX6 and the Brano acted very much in the same way, which I'm kind of confused about. I don't know if this was a me thing specifically, but I'm pretty used to exposing Sony cameras and it's just something to consider. The next major issue I saw and everyone is talking about this is the IR pollution in the internal ND, which makes it unusable. Robert Machado has an amazing review on this camera with a side by side comparison to the Brano next to the FX6. So if you're interested in that topic specifically, go check out his video. To compensate for this and having no internal ND, we rented out a set of ND filters. 
For a camera at this price point and for me to rent out external NDs is something that is completely mind boggling because it is supposed to have built in NDs that are usable. IR pollution, especially this bad, is not really fixable in post. And I was just very shocked in seeing these results from other people using the camera. And when we put up the first image to actually see if this was true, this is something that we saw in all the blacks and really across the image and you could really see the difference. Beside these issues, the production with this camera went very well for the shots that we wanted to achieve. This camera fits very well in our workflow to achieving these specialty type shots where a smaller camera such as this is needed. For example, for the, all the rotation shots we use, I would use a camera very similar to this or even an FX3, just because how small it was. Generally, when you're doing any of these setups with the camera that far off a certain mounting point, things start to flex and bend. And if I had any camera heavier, such as the Venice or anything like that, I feel like that would be the max. But just due to the, how the form factor of this camera is designed and how light it is, it worked really well for this setup. Overall, the camera performed really well with all the shots in each of the scene. And the director and I were very happy how everything was looking. But there was one major issue we ran into when we tried to review the footage. The Burano can shoot in a variety of codecs, but we always like to shoot the highest for our commercials so we can pull most of the information out in the coloring process. For this camera, that meant shooting in XOCN LT. I have shot on this codec many times with the Venice and had no issues in it in post. But when we went to bring in the footage in the editing software over lunch, all the files showed up black screen and as an audio file. So you can imagine what we were going through in terms of shooting a full on production of half a day going back to bring in our footage and none of it shows up. Luckily, with some digging around, we found that we could only view it through the latest version of Meteor Encoder and we were able to transcode it into a viewable format. This is another thing that blows my mind about this camera. If I want the most amount of information out of this camera, I have to transcode the footage to another codec for it to be even viewed and edited. And then I can't even have a colorist work off the raw files because they can't be viewed. I feel like Sony just didn't do a lot of testing with this camera and it was really rushed to market because there's so many little issues like these. In the community, there are a lot of mixed feelings about this camera, and there are so many things I didn't even cover, such as the rolling shutter or output issues. But if we look at just the price of this camera and what's needed to rig it out as well as media, you're looking around 30 to 35,000 USD. And at that price point, you can buy a used Venice one for much cheaper and you get a lot better image quality if you really think about it. But the form factor of this camera is its true selling point. Overall, this camera serves a purpose and for me, it doesn't fit in the line of work I personally do, and especially with running a production company. This camera does have a niche though. And if I was an owner operator who does a lot of high-end corporate work, this would fit the bill exactly. But with the overarching price point and much needed firmware update to fix some of the possible issues, I don't think this camera impressed a lot of people. If you're interested in more gear related videos and more content like this, where we talk about cameras and how they fit our workflow, let us know in the comments below. Thanks for watching, subscribe for more, and I'll see you in the next video.